welcome to Tuesdays with Karen and Martha. Martha, do you know what is really important to get children to start to read? Well, first of all, I want to say welcome everyone to Tuesdays with Karen and Martha. And today we're going to share with you from our book, Homeschooling in Time of COVID-19. And today we are dealing with how to teach language arts to your child. Um, yes, so I have been an elementary teacher too. I've taught from, well, I should say K, but I didn't, I only taught K music, um, music, wannabe music teacher. Um, but I taught from third grade all the way up to college level really. And I've had, and I've done language arts for all of those years. Okay. So it is really a pleasure to be able to teach young ones to learn to read. I remember my little second and third graders walking in and then I have a new word on the wall or on the board and they're using, you know, phonemic awareness and they're just coming up with the word and it makes you feel so full field that you actually were able to teach children to read. Do you, do you ever and, try word of the day? Where yes. You, you well, hold up your hand and you say, hey, today we're going to pick out a word and they say, what word is it? And you'll say, they'll say pup. And we'll say, okay, let's hold, hold up your fist. We're going to sound it out. P -a -p. And they get they say, you say, what is that word? Let's sound it, put it all the sounds together. Uh, uh, puh, puh. And then they can put a penny on the, write the letters down on the board or on a piece of paper, get a penny and put the penny on top of the letters and move the penny across the letters. So they learn how to put all the sounds together. So th that's a method that I used to do. And I put the little words on each of like a whole, table of different letters of the alphabet mm -hmm. and then they would begin to learn that different letters have different sounds and oh. things like that and i never thought that low i thought third i found that third grade my lowest grade i thought was third to read wow. so they they've already come in with all of that sound magic and now you're just teaching them to you know meaning word meaning and get make sure that they can use their word attack skills to get words going. So I had the best part, which is people who taught first and second did all the hard work. I didn't, I didn't have to do but the it, hard work. It, it <laughs> can be, you know, there are some really, like how to teach your child how to read in a hundred days. That's, there's a, some really amazing books that really narrate like exactly what to say to your child. Because I think as the parent and as it is hard work and as the teacher, it gets, if, especially if you if you have a creative person, it can be very boring. Yes, like have to say the same thing every day, but they need that repetition. Right. Yeah. So there are, there are different schools of thought. There are some people who think that the, the child should just learn to read from just listening to someone read. Um. Yes, it has happened in several cases. But when kids learn the sound of letters, they learn their word attack skills way better. Um, I know that there are different schools of thought. Some people don't think, they think phonics is just garbage. Um, others think that, yes, you need to teach phonics. So Montessori school, for example, they use, they focus on letter sound rather than letter name. So they would focus more on a equals a, a rather than A for apple. They would go for more the sounds of the letter rather than what yeah. the letter says. And you find that the kids are reading way earlier. At four and five, the kids are reading because they can say, su, uh, you know, su, um, thumb. They get it. I mean, like, you know. And there are different what? children learn differently. Like some kids exactly. they learn the sight words, they learn words. Right. Not by sounding the mouth, by recognizing exactly. the whole word. Which exactly. Is and I always say, I always say, my son learned to read that way. Every night I had to read to him every night before he went to bed. And if he didn't, if I didn't, he would sit underneath the table and do my lesson plans up top. 
and he's underneath the table and I dare not, I just cannot focus because I have to go and make sure I read to him. And I would be worried about going to read to him because I would fall asleep. <laughs> I have my lesson plans to do for the next day. But I can say that he learned to read by just five words. We just read in the same book a hundred times. And so he learned the words because he was able to see that way. Of course, his teachers did all of that song magic, but I was not the one who did, did the song magic. I just did, I just read books. We just read new books, reread, re read. And you know what's funny? When our children are very young, we encourage them to reread a book. We have them read the book three and four and five and six and seven times. But then when our kids are seventh and eighth grade, we see them pick the same book again and we say, oh, you read that book already. Well, when we reread, we are encouraging fluency. And so, I mean, for me, I have read The Alchemist so many times. Um, I taught, the, we taught the, it was one of our reading books in the last, in my high school, in Charles and Mary High School. And so, because I taught 12th grade and we taught, we had block scheduling, it means that I read the book twice every day. Yeah. But even after I stopped, teaching the book i have still read read it so many more times i've listened to it at least once this year already and don't you feel so, every time you read it you get something different out of it every time yeah. every time i read that book i'm like i don't remember that book at all i don't remember that word i don't remember that concept i don't remember that you know so it's okay to reread books do not have kids feeling that oh you read that book before well, I'm not saying that you should let them, it should be assigned every year as a reading book in school. I'm just saying if a book, if a child picks up a book for independent reading, they read it before, it's okay because that child is developing fluency, especially if the, the book is on grade level or if it, it, it has some level of complexity. If we, you're telling students to read complex text, they're not going to get the definition or, or the meaning of that complex text the first time they read it. It's yeah. not going to happen. They have to read that story as many times as they want to, especially if they liked it. If they hated it, don't force them to read it a million times. But we want to make sure, and that's what we mean by fluency. Fluency means you have to be able to read that story or that sentence or that text without with limited errors. Being able to enunciate, pronounce, do all of those things and also get the meaning. And you know, so, some children though are not as fluent as others. Some children will pick up a book and through having it read to them over the years and they'll become fluent readers, but other children are um, take a while to process and have what we call in some circles, learning disabilities. Now I'm not a fan of saying that a child has a disability because that means they're disabled. So mm -hmm. I believe that children grow and learn how to read at different paces based on the way their brain works. So just as some children learn how to read through phonics and uh, like a bead on beads on a necklace, that's like little pieces, mm -hmm. some children learn in like little oh. chunks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they chunk the words together to, and they know all the words. And some children just orchestrate and they just take the whole thing in. And they, I've seen children just read, you know, speed read through things and they can just somehow suck in all that knowledge and by reading a whole page at a time. Yes. And some of it is just repetition too. Yeah. Um, we have those programs right now where we have just having the kids use sight words and repeat it all the time and then they're able to when they see that word again they just say it because somebody said it to them 10 times they remembered it and now they're saying it not because they did they know the phonetic um you know breakdown of the word or phonemic breakdown of the word but because they've heard it 10 times said in a particular way and they're able to repeat it it's like a child learning to talk on dora the explorer or spongebob you but know. there are some children like they get they confuse the D and the B, and they think the D and the B are the same, or they mix them up. And 
I believe that there's something neurological going on with the child. They might have something called dyslexia and they might not be able to tell the difference. And I've, I've noticed, this is odd, but I've noticed that when a child, usually this is a problem in first and second grade, and then they grow out of it. And I've seen a lot of children with this problem. And a lot of times they grow out of it when they learn how to ride a bicycle. And I think there's something about the left brain, right brain connection in a child's development that switches on later on. But there's a trick I want to share with you. Um, you put on your BD glasses and you know that this is B and this is D. Mm. And then they put them back down on the page and they can tell the difference between B and D. So there's like little tricks like that that you can use to help your child you know, encounter difficult, when they encounter difficulty, they can learn strategies that help them face the, the difficulty of distinguishing between things like that. So um, try to learn tips and things like that and, and read books on how to teach reading to your child because you're going to find that some things work for some children and not for others. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you, have you had experience with children with dyslexia in your teaching? Oh, yeah. oh yes, I had a, I had a ninth grader, but she, no, she was a 10th grader. And um, I didn't know that she was dyslexic. I thought, brilliant young lady. She, every time we have oral discussion, we, we, you know, we, we've read a story in class and she can answer questions and she can discuss. Her level of discussion is just so mature. But every time we did a test, she failed. And I, I couldn't put my finger on it. So when her mom came one day and I said, of course, she didn't have an IEP or any of those things. So when her mom came and I said to her, I don't understand why your daughter is just so good as far as oral expression, discussion. I know that she understood the work. She can express that orally, but when it comes to writing, she always, she doesn't score well. And she says, my daughter is dyslexic. I'm like, here we go. Um, I said, you know, she said, well, she's been tested, but we're still working on the paperwork and all of those things. So here it is that a teacher who is not an expert on all of those things is recognizing that there isn't a problem, but because the process, the system has a process, where you have to go through a doctor and then go through a, a psychologist and then go through a whatever. So there's a process that must take place before that child can be given, um, say, I don't wanna say a diagnosis, but a documentation so that another, the, the instructor can know that you are dyslexic or you need um, help, modification. You need, um, how would I say, it? yeah. Some kind of So, and even if I recognized that something was wrong, I just didn't know what it was until it was the end of a marking period where the parent came in and I said, this is what I noticed with the child. I just cannot understand why her level of intelligence when she speaks and discusses does not match what she does for me on paper. And she said, and so here it was, I got, I, I understood it. So one of one of the reasons right now at in, I, in I'm in the public school and one of the things I, like some teachers would say, for example, we have programs that we have for supporting teachers and Catherine Island Academy, by the way, they use those programs as well. And those programs have op options where you can give the student an opportunity to listen, or you can just have them read to themselves. And I would hear some teachers say, oh no, they, if I give them the opportunity to listen, then I'm making them lazy. They're not going to learn. I am of a totally different school of thought. If a child can read, they will not get that boring person to read to them because it's not a very engaging way to, that, that robot on the computer goes, it's so, you know, it's not, the, you know, the inflections are not there. So if a child can read, they're not going to use it. Yeah. So I shouldn't remove it because I think that you're going to be at a, an advantage. It's okay. 
if I feel that I'm tired today, I can read very well, but I want this robot to read to me, then so be it. It's okay. I do the better. And you shouldn't be taking it away from me because you feel that I should be able to read it. I think that it's not a reading lesson. It is maybe a social studies lesson or a language arts for that matter. But if that child thinks that they need that, just earlier this week, um, one of my teachers said to me, I have a situation with a child where he, he does not, he told me that he does not understand what he reads. I went around, I went and I looked up his scores and I saw truly he is a high level with his um, vocabulary, but his comprehension is low. And so I called him in and I said, you know, can you, can you tell me about such and such? And he said, when I read, I just do not understand what I'm reading. And I said, would it help if somebody read to you or would it help if you were able to listen? And he said, yes. So here's a child who knows words on almost the 11th grade level, but then is not getting the comprehension questions right. Because he's like, when he reads, even if he reads it out loud, he just cannot, he just doesn't get it. He needs to hear it out loud from somebody else. And when I so, think about, when you think about technology and where our society is going in terms of being an accomplished uh, person and contributing to society, in the future, many people will not need to read. You know, I'm not saying that we should stop reading, but for somebody like this gentleman you're talking about, if he gets a job working in, the, in a place where he can listen to instructions, Maybe, you know, it's for parents who have children who aren't great readers, it's not the end of the world. They can still right. process the information in a different and the point way. I, and, and the thing I'm saying is sometimes you just need that help. It, it doesn't mean that, and of course he can read. He can read, he knows words. He knows words almost on a college level. So it's not an idea that he doesn't even know words. It's, it's, it's just a processing issue. You know, I've, had so, parents, I've had parents come to me and um, they, sometimes there have been kids that don't learn how to read uh, books until they're 12 years old. Exactly. And then once they do, there's a light bulb that goes off and exactly. you can't stop them. Right. So, but, but what I would like, people, we should have options. I mean, right now I'm at the place where, I mean, I've read a lot. Um, but I'm at the place where I want to be, I mean, my grandma read to me too. And I remember those days when we just had, you just sat there and just listened to, especially on a rainy, when it was raining, and then you just sat and just listened to stories. And I still, that maybe that's why I love Audible so much, because I just get to that place where I, I go to, I, I mean, I, I peruse, if they have several authors and people reading the same story, I check to see which voice I prefer to hear. And I pick that voice and I just want to hear you read to me. And um, so I, I have nothing wrong against kids. Actually, we have that, um, the Learning Ally, which is a program too, where they just read books to kids who are not able to. But I feel like it shouldn't just be for kids who are not able to read or who struggle with reading. Yeah. It should be anybody who wants that option. And they have a free uh, program, or maybe it's like a. It's gonna make me not be here. Here. It's gonna just make me, maybe gobble more. Hmm? Yeah, they have a program though available for kids with IEPs that for like fifty dollars a year you can get every textbook that they have um, read to them aloud. It's probably Learning Ally, but you don't pay for that, and they have published. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Learning Ally is um, really where they call it, uh, it's like copyrighted pretty much. Mm -hmm. So um, they have almost every book, including the textbooks are on there as well. Wow. Um, so you, it can be read to kids, but um, it's not a, the only thing is it's not for every child. It's for a child who, there are a few criteria, you know, that we have to make sure that we make it available for those. Wow. So um, do you think that there is a problem with um, neurological differences or attention deficits? For? For, for reading comprehension? It's not, it's not really, it, I don't think it's a belief or a thought. 
I just know that it is there's it's, there's a whole spectrum. Yeah. There's some kids who have neurological issues. There's some kids. It's just a matter of 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 environment. It's like I don't read at home. I don't see anybody reading. I don't care to read. It might be it's so many different things. It might be um you know I'm I'm not. It's just so many different things. It could be neurological. It could be it could be a, a whole plethora of reasons why people struggle in reading. I mean, I see kids where they read like you like, wow, how do you like you said earlier? I mean, in a previous episode you had that a six-year-old child was reading um the Harry Potter books. Well, they must have seen people around them read and then it's okay. Is she understanding what she read? Maybe, maybe not, but then you have the movies that you can go by. So again, it's 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 um but language acts is a little more than reading, by the way. So we can take that, you can take us to let you know. Oh, you know what? I wanted to tell that joke because what you were just saying, it reminds me of that joke about how you know all children are different. Mm -hmm. And we know that um there's a reason they're different. And it might they have a gift, and you you're the kind of teacher that looks at a child instead of looking at them and thinking what's wrong about that child, you look to see what's right about them, what's working. And um, the story I wanted to tell about is there's this man and he's got a screw in his belly button and he's like, everyone makes fun of him. And so he goes to the, to the woods and he prays to God and he says, God, please make this screw come out of my belly button. I don't want it here. It's embarrassing. So this beam of light comes down out of the heavens and shines on his belly button. And he's, you know, he's praying, he's on his hands and knees and praying to God. And this belly button, this uh, screw goes and falls out onto the ground and he jumps up for joy to say hallelujah and his leg falls off. <laughs> And the moral of the story is just because you're different doesn't mean it's bad. You know, everything that we have, all our warts and our, you know, things that look awkward or different, it's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And when you're a parent and you have a child that, you know, they might not fit in or they don't look, they don't read when everyone else does, it's, a, there's a reason for it. And mm -hmm. if you look at the big picture, you just remember that joke. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So we we want parents to understand that um language arts is a little more than reading. It's all about you know how you interpret what you read, how we all of those things like literary devices that we come across when we come up with things like similes, metaphors, or just understanding a poem, pretty much. So a child reads a poem, and then you know when you you, you ask questions like. What does the speaker of the poem, you know, try? What is the speaker trying to say? Who is the speaker? So all of those things, all of the different genre of writing or reading, sorry, that you would, I mean, that you come across, literature that you come across, is all about on that second meaning. So yes, we can look about complex text, but what is it saying? What are we getting from it? Whether we're reading the Gettysburg Address or we're reading just a poem, I Rise by Maya Angelou, or we're reading anything for that matter, but you know, whoever you, your, your favorite person might be, is how does that child interpret all of those things? It's so not just that, about how you match print, voice to print, exactly. what you're thinking. Exactly, so it's, it's a little more than just being able to read text, it's about being able to interpret meaning, being able to, understand different genre what is what could i expect if i'm reading something that entertains or something that informs or something that um persuades or something that you know describes so kids all of that's what language acts is about and so we want to make sure that you are very versed so if you are homeschooling and you have not yet gotten a copy of the book homeschooling in time of covid19 you can get it on Amazon for only $2.99 as an ebook and $7.99 as, as the print copy. And on page 
53 all the way to, well, actually, page, language has to be there. Did I have it right? All the way to page 70. So chapter eight, all of chapter eight gives you step by step what your child should know in language arts from kindergarten, second grade, each grade, it's right there for you. K, they should be able to recognize all letters and numbers. Write all letters, numbers one to 20. Know all the letter songs. So it gives you an idea. So if you're homeschooling your child, trust me, this is like a little manual for you. Everything your child needs to do in language arts on each grade level up to the 12th grade is right in there for you. Of course, you can get it on your state's website, but we have fashioned this using paying close attention to the common core state um, standards pretty much. So in other words, if you use this, you, you're doing standards-based teaching and you should not be worried about whether if you decided that you're going to take your child back to the public school, as long as you follow this, you should not be worried that you are behind. So we have, for example, in the 12th grade, you should integrate literature, um, expand practice of narrative, read chapter book, all of the things you can do, it's right in there. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, and just remember that don't be too worried if your child isn't meeting all of these expectations right away, but aim for them and, and reinforce them and put the hours in that you need, the yes. experiences that they need to understand the literature they're reading mm -hmm. and discuss it and make it a rich environment so that they can really learn not just voice to print match, but how to interpret mm -hmm. the ideas that are presented in great literature. And if, if you do this with your child, you too might be furthering your knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And it might be a very rich experience if you share that with your family. Yes. So if you're listening to this broadcast today and you would like a copy of our book, we have a few copies to give away, at least two of them. So you can email us um, or leave a message below this broadcast, either on Facebook or on YouTube. And we can connect with you and send you your copy. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Like and subscribe and look for us next Tuesday when we share with you another chapter of our book. All right? Hey, thank you.